My monitor's not working. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. My monitor wasn't working. Um, uh, I have a few, uh, another uh, lesson for the day for all of you. Um, the first one is that um, you'll notice that I'm behind schedule. On the tape, you'll notice too I'm behind schedule. I don't care. Okay? And to some extent, this thing about staying on schedule and covering the goals really represents, and you'll see it as we go through the course, sort of a philosophical uh, difference in, in uh, what education ought to be. I'll put it, you'll tell which side I'm, I'm on rather than, uh, <clears throat> by, by the way I put it, is the object of education to teach the materials or to teach the students. They're a little nasty, right? Cover the material, doesn't matter. Cover the material, cover the material. Gotta get going. The, the test is coming. This and, or is I make up my own test so I can change them if I get behind? I don't care. So, right? Or is the object to be sure that, you know, you're covering the material, things are going on, people are asking questions. Okay, and by the way, you can tell I'm doing new material on the IQ test because it's new, okay? And um, you might get a little uh, flummox when you start doing new stuff. Don't panic. If it happens, it happens, okay? The problem, of course, with what I'm saying is, meanwhile, here comes the tacky test. You gotta have to cover the stuff on the tacky test. Drill for the tacky test, so, and it becomes, uh, becomes a little difficult, I understand that. But hopefully some of you will be able to get beyond that. Some of you will be in situations where you're not, the kids will, We'll do okay on the test anyway, so you can do other things, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, let's go back uh, to the PowerPoint. I did make one, uh, one little, are we on it? Yeah. Some people ask me questions about it. Look, the, uh, the stars, the stars on the IQ test are the ones that are used to compute overall IQ. Is that way to get that on? Thanks. To compute overall IQ. The... The black ones are old tests, and the blue ones are new tests. And somebody who was very insightful, I can't remember who it was, said, gee, coding is not on the old IQ, but you have it in black. That's right, because just like on, the, on this test, you can see the ones without the stars are sort of supplementary tests. Coding was a supplementary test on the old one. Not so it's not, span. what? Coding was on the old one, digit span. Oh, digit span, excuse me, digit span. Take it back, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Digit span was on the old one. Digit span is, say after me, right? One, three, seven, five, nine. Repeat, one, three, seven, five, nine. Interestingly enough, just as a hint, once again, here's, okay, I'm gonna say some numbers and you say them after me. Seven, one, six, two, six, five, six, six, nine, five. Go ahead, say them. Push it down. Somebody push it down. Go ahead, push it down and say it. Go ahead. <laughs> say them. Anybody? Nobody. Okay, ready? I'm going to do it again. Turn it into a telephone number. Seven one six two six five six six nine five. Go ahead. Okay. It's obviously easier, right? So basically, so basically, what we have here is. If, if you were to practice that, turn it into telephone numbers, turn it into telephone numbers, all of a sudden your IQs are going way up. And that's, again, one of the problems with this whole kind of thing. But in any case, so you can see that much of this has to do with, and by the way, there are people who take courses in how to improve your memory, which we'll see with information processing, right? And, and their scores on standardized tests, especially if they study for them, go way up. All right, and in any case, Last time, last time we, uh, we got, I believe, to learning disabilities, one of my favorite topics, and we said, let's go to PowerPoint. We said that, I photo from Franz Kafka, an author. 
he said, just because your doctor has a name for your condition doesn't mean he knows what it is. And of course, this is his way of talking to us about circular explanations. And I ended, come back to me, by telling you about the argument between my aunt and my uncle, right? And this, um, this same logic applies. If you want to know how to do science, if you want to know how to draw conclusions that make sense, if you want to have meaningful explanations, just look at what the whole field of learning disabilities does, do the opposite, and you'll be in good shape. Okay, so let's start here. Let's start, let's go to the PowerPoint now and see learning disabilities. Learning disabilities, just like IQ, they're also a statistical construct. Okay, see if we can get my picture in there. That means that no one goes and photographs a brain and says, aha, I can see you have this neurological problem or that neurological problem. Aha, I have a theory of how humans think and learn, and I can see that you have a defect in this particular way that you learn. Okay, there's none of that. It's statistical construct based on tests, and it's determined by subtracting a person's score on a standardized achievement test from, today's a she day, from her score on the IQ test. Okay, so in other words, and, no, come back, stay in the PowerPoint. If the difference between the IQ and the standard IQ achievement test is greater than 15, in other words, if there's one standard deviation difference or greater, the student is considered to be learning disabled. Okay, come back to me for a second. So you can see what has happened is that basically all standardized tests, virtually all standardized tests, use the IQ type of scoring method. If you get the average, I'm going to give you 100. If you're a standard deviation above the uh, average, I'll give you 115. If you're standard deviation below, I'll give you 85. If you're half a standard deviation, I'll give you, I don't know, 108, 107, 108, however it works out. Okay? And there were, for instance, there was one standardized test, whose name I forgot now, that said I'm 10. If you're one standard deviation above, I'll give you 110. Right? I'm just going to arbitrarily make 10 points for a standard deviation. But it didn't last. It couldn't last because it couldn't play the statistical game. So it went to 115. And what happens here, so let's take a look at this. Let's go back. Student A, student A has an IQ of 100 and a standardized achievement score of 86. Some standardized achievement tests, there are many of them. Some of you have heard them, the Towel and the Woodcock Johnson and the, there are all kinds of standardized achievement tests. Iowa tests, although it's usually not used for this because can't administrative person. See if you can get my picture in there. That difference is 14, so the person is not learning disabled. Student B has an IQ of 101, an achievement of 85, one point difference, difference of 16, that student is learning disabled. All right, now, if this doesn't strike as ridiculous, right? I don't know what's going on. Interestingly enough, the other day I was talking about this in my doctoral class, and one person there who's a diagnostician jumped all over me, and a few other people said, well, that's not necessarily true. There are mitigating circumstances. Sometimes you can do it. If you see, for instance, for instance, if this student's IQ, if this student's achievement, right, is fairly normal, a little bit below average, and way below, let's say, in math. You could push a case for learning disabled in math. Right? But this is basically the logic, right? So if the number is greater than 15, and if that number is greater than 15, we're treated to a whole host of circular explanations. Remember? You thought I was talking about this stuff for nothing. Or unsubstantiation, I'm sub let me try once more, unsubstantiated contentions about genetic damage. In other words, you know, there's something wrong with a kid, something wrong with a kid's brain. I've heard that a, a million times, right? And that's in order to explain the child, why the child cannot learn the way we are teaching. Okay, come back to me. So in other words, you have a, two tests that are motivated by the S word, statistics. You have the same problem on the achievement test too. Right? You gotta get, right? You gotta get the normal distribution. 
once you get the normal distribution, and that's how the tests work, okay? Sometimes it can get a little hairy. What's the difference between a math problem on an IQ test and a math problem on a standardized achievement test? What's the difference between a vocabulary standardized achievement test and the vocabulary on the on the uh, you know, on the standardized achievement test and the vocabulary on an IQ test? Now, before you go on, I have to tell you something because all the school psychologists are going to get mad at me. If you ask school psychologists are into the new way with their new statistical method of finding you know, answers, similar kinds of answers across the tests, they'll tell you, ah, total like you doesn't mean anything anymore. We just put it out to make people happy because they're used to it. What we're talking about is different skills that are revealed by our statistical technique. Again, skills that they just assume, they name it. Oh, if a kid was able to go fast, oh, that kid has fast mental processing. Although there's no evidence that that's true in the real world, right? If I have a person who can pass a ball at 100 miles an hour right onto a target, and I have a person who can shoot, right, 49 out of 50 baskets wherever you put that person, and I have a person who can dribble the ball like one of the Harlem Globetrotters, right, I cannot assume that that person is a good basketball player until I see that person play basketball. And there are plenty of people who have these individual skills. Get them out in the court and someone's got a hand stuck in his face and you got to go and you got to play and you got to this, you got to that, got to coordinate, got to run up and back, who are not very good at basketball. If they can say to all the players, get out of my way, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to shoot, they're fine. <laughs> but when the other player has a hand stuck in your face, they're not very good. Okay? So just because a person, you take a bunch of tasks that seem to require speed, that doesn't mean that the person will be less it doesn't necessarily has that kind of a skill in a regular situation. Or a person who's looking at a bunch of these tasks and say, what are these idiot tasks? That that person is slow in a situation that's of interest to her. And she really understands what's going on. You've got to test your contentions. <coughs> but IQ tests don't. In any case, I've said that before. Let me I gotta get that in there again. However... In order, even though the IQ people will tell you now, now we're looking at these skills that come about by these statistical techniques and that we never, you know, we don't care about the total IQ. So when I ask people, I say, okay, well, so what about LD? Oh, no, for that we need the total IQ score. For that we still have to do it. Even though they now admit that the score has nothing behind it, no theory behind it. Okay? Because otherwise they can't label people LD. Okay. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so circular terms that are used in schools do not tell why a child not cannot perform a task. They simply describe what the child cannot do in fancy words. Okay? So dyslexia means trouble reading disease. If you can't read, you have can't readia or dyslexia. If you can't do math, you have can't do mathia or dyscalculia, can't calculate. You got it? If you can't draw or you have sloppy handwriting, we can't say, well, you can't say can't drawsia or dysrhydia. So we say can't writea, so we say tr dysgraphia, trouble with writing. You understand? That's how it works. As a matter of fact, if you're smart, you'll make up your own and you'll become famous. Right? Come back to me. I mean, you laugh, but it's absurd. How many, pe how many people here have, have kids? Okay? Did you ever had a kid? How many of you had a kid who couldn't blow her or his nose? Okay? Some kids have that problem. Okay, one of my kids couldn't blow his nose. As a matter of fact, once he's smelling a flower and he got something stuck up his nose, he was three years old. I said, blow. He goes, <laughs> right? I had to take him to the doctor finally. I had to take him to the doctor to get the thing out of his nose. Right? So he had dysblosia. 
That's the old joke. You know, Doc, every time I go like this, my arm hurts. Oh, don't go like this, right? Mm -hmm. That's the old joke. I mean, if you went to the doctor and said, my foot is killing me, I can't walk it, it hurts, and I can't walk on it, the doctor says, well, what's the Latin word for foot pad? Okay, you have dyspedia. I think you'd run out of that office as fast as you could, right? You'd limp out of that office as fast as you could, right? You have something wrong with your foot. I mean, so it's, and this is what the game is, just make it up. And, and you think I'm kidding? There's another one. Let's go to the tablet called, I saw that just when you can't, dis, let me see if I can spell it right. I think it's with dysemia. There may be two M's. Don't, don't even bother with it. Dysemia. It's one word right here. Dysem, sorry. Dysemia. What does dysemia mean? Okay. There are some kids who don't get along with other kids in the playground. Okay. So this word, this root, comes from the Greek root for signs. They don't pick up social signs from other kids. Gee, really? <laughs> I never knew that, right? So they make it up, dysemia. Okay, come back to me. I mean, if, if you want to, you can think of one. You can think of one, right? I don't know, what other problems kids have? Kids have trouble twitching in their seats? You know what? They're twitching the seats. They can't say, you know what? I'm so lazy, I'm not going to even translate it into Latin. We'll just call it can't pay attention disease. Can't sit still disease. Can't pay, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't sound too good. What about attention deficit disorder? How does that sound? Oh, they're twitching? What about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? <whistles> what a sound. Can't pay attention because you can't pay, can't, can't pay attention disease? You're hyperactive because you have hyperactivity disease? Hyperactivity disorder? It's painful to me. It's painful. And you'll notice, never mind. Wait a second. And you'll notice where the cause of the problem is. Okay. Let's go, let's go to uh, PowerPoint. Look, descriptions of a symptom, no matter how accurate, do not constitute a diagnosis. Okay. Come back to me for a second. Look, I have, tell me your name. What's your name? Amisha. Amisha. Okay, Amisha comes to me. Amisha, raise your hand there. Where is she? There she is. See her right in the corner there? All right, we want all your fans to see you. Okay, Amisha comes to me, and, and I'm the doctor. And she says to me, you know, my nose is running, and my throat is sore and I have a fever, right? And I'm tired all the time. I say, oh, I'm gonna treat you. So first of all, I stick something on her nose and I measure how much mucus flows out of her nose in an hour to the nearest one hundredth of an ounce. Then I take her temperature and I have a, a, te a thermometer that'll take her temperature to the nearest one one thousandth of a degree. Her temperature is one 101.2796 degrees. Then I look in her throat and I take pictures and I map to within the nearest hundredth of a square inch how much of her throat is red. And then I time down to the nearest tenth of a second how much she sleeps during the day. I have all the data. But I didn't tell you what's wrong with her, right? That doesn't help. What's wrong with her? Okay. How many people already know what's not wrong with her? By describing her throat as just red, it's almost for sure that she doesn't have a bacterial infection. How come? Doesn't have a strep throat or something. When you have a bacterial infection, what happens to your throat? What? Push it down turns white? It's white, right. You get, you get pus in your throat. turns white. Every time I go to the doctor with one of these, I pray. I say, please let it be white. <laughs> then he can give me an antibiotic, right? And we're all set. <laughs> so no, it's just red. Go home and suffer, right? Here. Here's something to dry you up. Get out of my office, right? So, but it's okay. And take an Advil if you have a fever. So this is, so a doctor's going to try to tell you what it is, what's wrong. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. 
So standardized tests, IQ and achievement tests, describe at least to some extent what a child can and cannot do. They describe symptoms. They don't tell us why the child performing is performing as he or she is. Thus, they're not diagnostic. They're descriptive. You understand? They're descriptive. So, come back to me. So if I take, let me pick on somebody else. What's your name? Alexis. Alexis. I knew, you told me that once, right? Four times before? Okay, don't sit up front. So if I take Alexis, <laughs> if I take Alexis, and she's having trouble reading, okay? And I send her to the diagnostician, right? How old are you? Seven, right? Yeah, seven. And I send her second grade. And I send her to the diagnostician. Her reading's really very poor. And I come back, and the diagnostician tells me she has dyslexia. What do I know now that I didn't know before? I know she has dyslexia. I've been working with her for four months, and she can't read. Or she has great difficulty reading. That's all dyslexia means. What do I know now that I didn't know before? Why did I spend all that money and take Alexis' time? Why? Now, the diagnostician maybe can tell me, maybe can tell me what the standardized test shows her strengths. For instance, her word recognition is a little bit better than her ability to sound out words, right? She doesn't know the names of the letters. Gee, I knew that. Alexa, spell that word for me. Obviously, she didn't. Read what's here. Say the letters for me, Alexa. Well, I probably knew that. Okay, so, right, so I, but it can't tell me what's wrong. Furthermore, Furthermore, you will often find parents and teachers saying, I don't think this test is right. Okay, because you have to understand, this is a one-time snapshot of what's going on around a particular group of questions that were picked, not because they have some deep diagnostic ability, but because they give me a normal distribution. And I'm assuming that Alexa's ability to tell me what this group of words means is reflective of her vocabulary, okay? Now, if she's gonna be labeled learning disabled, she's okay for her age. Her vocabulary, you know, what do these words mean? The, wait a second. Wait a minute. The, the, what is it called? The, the word recognition part here. I'll give you the name in a second. Here we go. The uh, vocabulary. That's what it's called. The vocabulary part of the IQ. Okay. The vocabulary part of the IQ, she'll do okay. But I can be your teacher and say, you know what? Her reading is not, no, come back to me. Come back to me. Her reading is not that bad. But she runs into it, you know, she runs into a whole bunch of words she's sounding out when the other kids can recognize them already. So maybe she knows them verbally, maybe she can't read them, I'm not sure what happens. There's a certain group of tests that come together that told you, this is a test of distractibility, right? If the kid doesn't score as low on this, this, and this, the kid's distractible. You know, certain subtests of the IQ or certain parts of the subtests of the IQ. A lot of people say, really? How do you? I, I didn't see that. You never tested the kid in a real situation where he or she can be distracted, right? So in, in, the, in the end, we have kind of sort of a description of what her strength and weaknesses are, but it's based upon something that's, right? It, it, it doesn't really look at her in a real situation functioning really. 
trying to do real tasks. It's some predetermined set of scores that I think that I think are are um, indicative of something, but I don't have really too much evidence. Let me say one other thing. You understand that if I label Alexa LD, her IQ is okay for her age, which means the stuff, the general knowledge about, about math and about, and about vocabulary and about, uh, uh, you know, general information and how to put together puzzles and manual dexterity, that's about okay for her age. Might even be above average. She could have an IQ of 110 and have an achievement of 85. But the stuff I try to teach her, that she doesn't do very well with. The specifics that I tried to teach her. But it ain't my fault, baby. She's sick. Okay. So could you understand why? Because on the specific achievement test, she didn't do very well. The specific stuff that speaks to the kind of stuff that was, that's taught in school, that she didn't do very well. But she doesn't have dystichia. She has a learning disability. Okay, now let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so vast amounts of time, money, effort are spent labeling kids. But after we have the labels, after I'm told, Alexa has dyslexia and, tell me your name? Push it down. Push it down, push it down. TJ. TJ? And TJ has dyscalculia. And I don't know. Tell me, push it down, tell me your name. Jose. And Jose has, I don't know, make it up, dysgraphia, right? I still don't know how to improve his handwriting. I still don't know how to teach him math. I still don't know how to teach her how to read. Because all I have is, dis is descriptions of how they did on these tests. They don't tell me anything. Let's go back to the PowerPoint, okay? Since we don't know what's wrong, we don't know what to do. The recommendations made by diagnosticians are not based on understanding of the child's understanding of the kid's thinking, learning, etc. Because the test hosts don't give you that information. Come back to me. As a matter of fact, you're given very specific instructions about what to say and what not to say. And one of the things you don't say is, how do you figure? How'd you get that answer? How'd you come up with two cents instead of 10 cents? Well, I figured in the tax. Oh, that gets pretty smart. What's going on here with this word? You're never allowed to ask. How come? One time I was in the clinic and I was working with a, a seventh grader. And he, he had a lot of trouble reading, had been exposed to an intense phonics program. He said he can read better now. So here's how he's reading. I saw the uh, man go to the uh, store. In the uh, store, he bought a banana. The banana was ripe. The ripe banana. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading. I said, well, tell me what you're doing. He said, well, I'm, how do you read? He said, I'm sounding out the words. That's what you're supposed to do when you read. I said, you sound out every word as you read? He said, yeah. I said, well, what if you know what the word is already? He said, have to sound it out. That's how you read. Because I saw he sounded out the word banana four times, right? <laughs> I said, no. I said, if you recognize the word, you don't have to sound it out. You can just say it. He said, really? <laughs> I said, yeah. No kidding. I mean, he was stunned. Now, I admit that's an extreme case. But here's a kid who's a very slow reader because people forgot to tell him the next step after the phonics, okay? 
How do you know? What do you mean? What's going on here? Okay? Why is the kid weak in this and that kid weak in that? Why is the kid strong in this? Those tests don't give you any information. And therefore, when the diagnostician makes recommendations, there's a she day, she has no idea what's going to work or not. I'll tell you something that somebody once told me. The best diagnosticians are the people who were teachers for a long time. And they just use their teaching instincts to make their recommendations. I, I think I concur with that. Right? But the tests don't tell you what to do. Okay? The tests don't tell you what to do. Now, I, I, I have to tell you something that to me is perhaps the most important thing here. I have a lot of people out there, you know, on the ramparts in the wars, in the schools, students, graduate students, and others who say, look, I know you're right. I know it's true. But I have to do it in order to get the kid a label. Because without a label, you can't get special services. Okay? Go ahead. Tell us your name for the ninth time. Dane. Again? Dane. Dane. So it's the equivalent of taking a number and a line well, not really, because you have to be qualified to get the number. You understand what I'm saying? That's what I mean, is, is you're, you're getting these kids to stand in a bureaucratic... Well, that's exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. In other words, if you... And some people say, look, I know that this kid needs help. But if I can't get the kid a label, the kid's not legally entitled to the help. So they label the kid. The problem is, for me... If you don't know what's wrong, how do you know what to do? That's the problem. Because once you get in the line, how do you know that what's going to happen? Or as a friend of mine says, I think I told you this, in this No Child Left Behind, he teaches in another place, he said, he tells to his classes, before you get worried about whether your child's going to be left behind or not, you ought to find out where everybody's going, right? <laughs> he said, I, I said, I want my, this time he said, I want my grandkids left behind <laughs> because I don't like where this whole thing is going. The same thing here. How do you know what to do? So, for instance, if we have, if we have uh, TJ, right? TJ had dyscalculia six, Okay. And so I have a number of exercises to teach him how to add. Okay? What's your name? You have initials too, right? No. TJ, also. Two TJs. They're lying. They're just trying to uh, send me to a mental institution, right? So, okay. Some psycho, but I get to TJ and I say to TJ, TJ, the same, what do you think about the fingers on this hand and this hand? They're more on one hand, it's the same. He says it's the same. I say, what about now? He said, oh, now they're more there. What about now? Oh, now there are more there. TJ, six doesn't understand what a number is, which is fairly normal. Okay? Most kids who are six understand, but plenty of normal kids don't. Now, if I start to drill him on math to teach him to add what he doesn't understand the difference between six and seven, I'm doing a horrible thing to him. A psychologist was coming to say, let's see his development. Let's see whether he's cognitively ready to learn this stuff. By the way, the same thing applies to, to reading. I'm doing some research now on the cognitive, con cognitive understanding of reading. Let's see if he does. Let's see what his memory strategies are. We'll get into all of these theories, and we'll see. But this stuff doesn't do anything. As a matter of fact, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Ooh, that shirt's an ugly color on TV. All the fancy names we have diseases for these diseases are simply circular explanations. They give fancy sounding names to a disease, but that's not a diagnosis. Just because you have a fancy sounding name, as Kafka said, doesn't mean that you know what's going on. They do not identify an etiology for the supposed diseases they describe. An etiology is a cause. 
That's what they don't do. So when, come back to me. So when, tell me your name again. Amisha. Amisha. When Amisha comes in and I look and I do and I take swabs, and I say, you know what, Amisha? You have an influenza infection type B or type C, whatever it is. I don't know. Amisha, you have mononucleosis. That's a diagnosis. And let me give you an example with mononucleosis. My son comes in, he has, his nose is running, he's got this, he's got that, right? The doctor says, I'm not sure what it is, I'll look. He said, but secondary infections can set in. He said, there's a small chance bacteria, I'll give him an antibiotic. He gets up the next morning, he is covered with spots, red spots all over him. Called the doctor in a panic, he said, oh, now I know what it is, it's mono. He said, if you give people, if you give people Antibiotics, when they have mono, they get skin eruptions and they get skin itching or spots or something happens to their skin. I said, oh, thanks a lot. He said, throw it, don't discontinue the antibiotics. And he wasn't like this, where you usually get mono, he had a mild case. The doctor said, it's going to get worse if, you, if he runs around though. So of course, he's 11, he's running up and down the stairs. No, he wasn't 11, I take him, he's 14. He's running up and down the stairs and he's doing all kinds of stuff, it stops. Okay, now, at this time it was just spots. But suppose if you give back antibiotic to someone with mono, they're going to serious convulsions. By not knowing what it was, the doctor gave a treatment that made things worse, not better. Okay, so it was, wasn't anything serious, right? In two days they went away after we stopped the antibiotics. But that's the principle, that's the point. They don't tell you what's wrong, you don't know what to do. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And here's the problem. All failures are blamed on the kid. We maintain without having any evidence to substantiate our claim that something, there must be something wrong with a student. Okay, using a sensory modality. Okay, come back to me for a second. Imagine that a car company puts out a car. I don't know how long this tape is gonna run, but I'm having pity on American car companies at this if they're not doing well, so let's pick another one. Volvo, so the car. And 10% of the cars, people have trouble steering. They have accidents. Volvo comes and says, you have dystrivia. There's nothing wrong with our cars, you have dystrivia. Right? Honda puts out a car. People are hitting the brakes and they're smashing into people. You have dyspushia. You're not pushing down on the brakes fast enough. Most of the people can stop the cars. Most of the cars work. There's something wrong with you. Okay? And usually we maintain that if something is wrong in a sensory modality, that's why the kid's not achieving, okay? So for instance, the person has an auditory processing problem. Who's heard that? A visual processing problem, you heard that too? Okay, I'll tell you how I got onto this. I'm in a doctoral class and I just sort of accepted this stuff. I didn't know what it meant. So, I mean, I just hadn't really explored this. This was many years ago and the student says to me, the child had an auditory processing problem. So first of all, people are not computers. I don't know what you mean by processing, but uh, I didn't do that. I said, well, can you explain to me what the process is and where it's breaking down? I wasn't being nasty. I was asking, can you give me the hypothetical, theoretical, you know, uh, 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 process that people who work in this have, have thought about. You know, this is step one, step two, step three, step four, and if you can do these steps, you can solve the problem. This kid, kid can't do step three, and that's why she can't solve the problem. So what's the process? And it's perfectly okay to identify hypothetical psychological processes and then test to see whether, you know, you're, you're onto something. So she goes, well, 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 well. The information goes into the kid's ear, but it gets scrambled in the brain, and that's how the kid doesn't know it. So I said again, in all innocence, I said, how do you know? And I expected, you know, 
EEGs, you know, they put the things on your head, and CAT scans and PET scans. I expected that. Well, that's what I got. I said something's rotten here. If I give you an achievement test and an IQ test, and from that determines something is wrong with your brain, and I never inspect your brain, and that's true of 90-something percent of the kids who are labeled learning disabled, that's horrible. It's horrible. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, wait, come back, I gotta tell you one more story. I'll tell you one more story. Come back to me. One day, we're talking about something about a kid having a visual processing problem. The kid was writing something, couldn't see well, and he couldn't process visual information. That's why he couldn't read. In this case, it was a boy. So I said to the person, why don't you teach him Braille? <laughs> there you have Braille. That's the way to learn how to read for people who can't see at all. Why don't you teach him Braille? It was like I'd hit him. He sort of got stunned. He said, well, 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 uh, well, uh, I'll tell you what it is. He said, well, um, only blind people can effectively use Braille. If you can see, you can't really become proficient in Braille. By the way, sighted people who teach blind people to read Braille, they don't read the Braille with their fingers. They read it with their eyes. Okay? It's faster reading with your eyes can't see, then you have to read with your fingers. Right? You understand what I'm saying? So the, 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 the bumps that are on the page, they recognize them as an alternative alphabet, and they just read it with their eyes because, it's, as I said, it's faster. So there's really no one who's proficient, or there are very few people who are proficient reading Braille with their fingers who are not blind, right? So that's what he said. In other words, you get blind, something triggers in your brain, all of a sudden you can learn Braille. I mean, it's just, it's absurd. If a person has an auditory processing problem, so teach the person to read the way you teach a deaf person to read. That's a problem. But it's not the problem. It's always in the senses. It's in the senses. Person can't feel, and we have things like, never mind, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So what happens, let's go back to the PowerPoint now, when we ignore science and accept explanations, even though there's no evidence to support them, then it's open, baby, anything goes. You can offer any explanation without having the burden of providing evidence, any evidence that it has merit. Okay, so most of you know, most of you know the ones, see if you can get my picture in the corner, most of you know the ones, oh, it's neurological damage. As a matter of fact, I have an article by the then head of the Orton Society, she said, Neurologists know there's something wrong with these kids, neurologically. They just don't know. Come back to me now if you can't get my picture in the corner. They just don't know what it is. If you don't know what it is, how do you know there's something wrong? And interestingly enough, doctors, I once read something from the Ophthalmologist Association. It basically was, get that stuff away from us. We have no expertise in this area. All we can do is measure whether the kid can see or not. If the kid can see, leave us alone, practically in those words. This shirt is supposed to be blue, not green. What's the matter? A new shirt, I got it for my birthday. All right. So here's, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Here are some of the explanations we get for why kids can't read and things that we do, okay? Chiropractors manipulate skull bones. I'm not making any of this up. Kid can't read because something's off manipulate the skull bones. Read through colored paper. Kid is having trouble understanding how to read. Put red paper, you know, cellophane paper that you can see through. Or it's paper or colors. Poke a hole in the paper and read around the edges. I'm not lying to you. Prescribe anti-dizziness medicine. Come back to me. I'll give you some more. Come back to me. Can you come back to me? Have the kid. I'm going to stand up. Can you get it back on me when I stand up? Have the kid get on a board. Here, you see this? 
there's a piece of rubber on here, and walk on the board because it's brain side in this. That's Orton on the Orton Society. And that'll get the kid's brain in balance. Walking on a board is going to teach the kid how to read. I'm not lying to you. I'll tell you a story that gives you... Does anybody remember this whole idea about trace viruses? Oh, that was big for a while. A virus comes in, it causes something to go... It, it does something to your anatomy, then it goes away. And 20 years later, the symptoms appear. Ooh, what a great explanation. Woo! -hoo! What a great explanation. You can never be wrong. You don't know what the virus is, right? Finally, I mean, this was for several things that medicine didn't know, so it was a trace virus. Finally, people said, come on, give me a break. So I had a graduate student whose husband was an MD, right? He was doing his um, internship here, or his residency. He was doing his residency. And I said, let's make this up. I said, let's say that dyslexia is due to a trace virus that the kid got when the kid was an infant, and then it went away, and when the kid gets to school, can't do it. So let's just do it for a joke. Right, to show how silly this stuff is. I said, and get some medical terms from your husband. I said, you know, I, we can't do that. We'll get some medical jargon from your husband. We'll throw the medical jargon in. She came back the next day. She said, he won't do it. He wouldn't give me the terms. I said, why not? She said, because he said that if, you, if I do this and you put that paper out, he said, I guarantee you there'll be thousands of people who believe it. And he said, I'm not going to do it because it's... A, I mean, it's just, just name it. What's the cause? You name it. You know those elves on the, do we talk about the elves on the moon with the oil? Do we talk about that? No. no? Okay. There are little elves on the moon, and they have little radar guns. They have little beam guns. And there are certain people they pick out, right? And they have different kinds of guns. They have math guns. They have, they have reading guns. So every time, I can't believe it, Alexis, right? Alexis goes to read, zing, they zam her with a gun. Zap her with a gun, boom. Every time TJ goes to do math, boom, they zap him with a math gun. There's as much evidence for me as for this other stuff. Reading through paper, okay, just name it. You're all assigned, I, I have confidence I'll keep assigning that, that article, by Goodman and Poyon, by the way, Dr. Goodman, and, you know, is on the, the faculty here. Right? About all the different causes of attention deficit disorder. Since that article was written, the more have come about sugar uptake and this and that, right? It's just all over the place. You name it, and nobody can agree on anything. Because it's, okay? Because it's, right? It's open. Once I violate the scientific method that I don't make assumptions, I don't say something without having the evidence, anybody can speak up, right? Attention deficit disorder has been accredited to neon lights, right? Just sit under neon lights. That was done from a random correlation, by the way, for those of you who know little statistics. I mean, just say whatever you want. Just, may, just say it. And by the way, when you try these things, they'll almost inevitably work. I'll tell you why. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the bottom 2% in the population of readers. I'm going to give a standardized test and reading. I'm going to take the kids who are in the bottom 2%. Okay? And here's my reading readiness. Here's my reading improvement program. Every day, un the kid won't know, the parents won't know, and the teachers won't know. I will take a list of the kids' names, put it against my head, okay, and say, read, 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 okay? Then I will drive around the school three times, <laughs> and each time I will say the name of each kid. Read, Johnny, read, Sally, read, et cetera, et cetera. Read, 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 okay? I will go to bed at night, okay? And I, as I fall asleep, I will play a tape recorder that does the same thing. Say the kids' names, I will fall asleep with my voice saying, Johnny will read, Sally will read, other will read, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? 
And then finally, every day for supper, I will spell out each kid's name in alphabet soup. I will spell out John, read, and eat, and eat it. Okay, now we're going to have a vote. A vote. How many people think that that method will work such that when I retest these kids six months later, I'm going to test them the whole school, they will have made improvement, they will no longer all be in the bottom 2%. Some of them will have made some improvement, but they're not going to be in the top, but they're going to move up. Wait, go ahead, go ahead. Are you getting paid to do this? Am I getting paid? Oh, yeah. Okay, but the teachers don't know, they don't know, and the kids don't know. Let's say I do it volunteer effort. I'm not giving the test, by the way. I don't give the tests. How many people think that this will work and these kids as a group will move up slightly? Who thinks it? One person. Who thinks it won't? You have to vote. Okay, here's what I'm going to come back to me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bet you a thousand, a thousand dollars against a hundred dollars. That's ten to one. I'll make, I'll make it easier. Fifty dollars against a thousand against a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's enough money for a trip to Vegas. Okay, and play a little poker too. You want to bet? I'll give you fifty to a thousand. Anybody want to bet? Put your money where your mouth is. Who's ready to make the bet? What? I'm not doing anything. I'm just doing what I told you I'm doing. Who said that? Okay, did you push it down? What did you ask, ask again? Are you grading the test? No. I have nothing to do with it. Just the standard test. I have nothing to do with it. That's a very good question, by the way. That's a very good question. Remember we talked about, because you know, people are often very prejudiced when they grade you. Go ahead. Did you make the test? No, it's a standard test. I'm not doing anything. The school gives the test in September, then they give the test again in March. And I'm just going to do what I did, and nobody's going to know anything. All right, you want to bet? You ready to bet? Who's ready to bet? Come on. That's a couple thousand dollars. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 100. You didn't bet 1,000. It's about $1,200. That's enough. It's going to work. Go ahead. The child should be improving throughout that time, so no, there's I, no way of attributing it to no, what you're doing. No, I understand what you're saying. She's saying this kind of way. But I'm not going to measure the child against the children against their previous performance. I'm going to measure them against the whole school. They're going to take the standardized test again with the whole school, and they're going to move up slightly as a group. Okay, the answer is obvious. It's called, for those of you who are interested in statistics, it's called, here, come out to the tablet. It's called regression toward the mean. By the way, never, 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 ever do this with the top 2%. It'll make it worse. Here I have the bottom 2%, right? Look, inevitably the extreme scores when you retest move toward the mean. Come back to, okay, oh, never mind, we're here, I'll tell you why. Look, tests are not perfect. By definition, no test is perfect, okay? Tests can overestimate or underestimate. Now, do you think that these kids at the very bottom here, that they, that they're, as a group, do you think there was more error toward overestimating their abilities or more toward error toward underestimating their abilities? Obviously, they're so low, and some kid had a bad day, this and that. It's possible there are some kids whose abilities were overestimated, but not too likely because they're so low. So when you retest them, they move up slightly because it's, it's unlikely that the same errors are going to come in again. The same thing here. You all know how many times sometimes you, you luck into a high score on a test. If you take it again, you wouldn't, you know, a similar test, you wouldn't luck into it, okay? Here, probably, the error is that way. In general, there's more overestimating error here than underestimating. Here, there's more underestimating than overestimating. So when you retest, it goes up. That's why most remedial programs work well.
Okay. There's another thing called, here, I'll write it up. Can you see up here? I'll write it down here. Called the Hawthorne effect. And the Hawthorne effect, I, I didn't have the Hawthorne effect, but the Hawthorne effect basically, just because it was found in a place in Hawthorne, Michigan, I think. The Hawthorne effect basically says, if you, if you make a change and you involve people in the change, the change always works better than the old program for a little while. So if I come and say to the teachers, okay, we're having this new reading program, I don't care what you think, we're doing it, you better do it my way or else, it's not going to work. But usually we don't do that, we say, oh, come back to me now. We say, oh, we're going to pick these three people who are going to be our master teachers, and you're going to go take a course. And then they're going to come back to all the other teachers and say, you're the pilot teachers for this great thing. We picked you because you're the special teachers. Oh, you're special, we need your report, we need your input, we need your this. You involve the people, it's going to work for a while. It almost always works better. For a while. So we do that, regression toward the mean, it's hard to lose. Okay? Okay, now let me ask you another question, another vote. First of all, I have to give you a little information about myself. This is just a hobby for me. Okay? I won the Irish Street sweepstakes. I won the power power lottery, powerball lottery. I won the Texas lottery twice when it was over 20 million. Right? I have a great investment guy. I have billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Who's that guy who owns Bill Gates? Chump change. I have so much money, I don't know what to do with it. It's invested so well so that if I go out and spend a million dollars, I go into an apartment store and spend a million dollars. By the time I come out, I have more money than I started with. That's how great my investment guy is. Okay? So I am now going to find out what's wrong with kids who have dyslexia. You come with any project to find out why these kids can't read, I'll fund it. You name it. Social interactions, family, family problems, neurological problems, 42 different kinds of neurological problems, nutrition problems, uh, 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 metabolism problems. The chiropractor wants to come and investigate the bones in the head, investigate the bones in the head, anti-dizziness medicine, walking on boards, you name it. Like, I'm ready to fund it. I know a lot of it will go away, but what do I care? I'm so rich. A lot of it will come to nothing. Now we're going to take a vote. You have to vote. I know people sitting in the back, so I think I can't see them. I can see. People are taking this course on TV. I'm going to hold you to your word of honor. Vote even though you didn't give it to me. Vote. How many people think that all, obviously a lot of the money is going to go for stuff that'll be a dead end, but that all things considered, how many people think that this is, prob, this, that this is a good way to do science? If you have enough money and enough resources, you can explore everything, you can explore every possible, every possible thing of what's wrong with these kids. Who thinks it's okay? Who thinks it's, it's no good? Why is it no good? Why is it no good? Tell me why you think it's no good. <clears throat> I'm picking on him today. Uh, I say the reason why it's no good is because everybody varies in different ways. I mean, the mind is developed to okay. different possibilities. Okay, he's right about that. So I'm going to have to amend it to say, let us find out the many possible different things that could be wrong with these kids. So he's pointed out to something very important. Just like a cold and the flu and a strep infection and a staph infection, if you go to the hospital, you can get those. Once I had 14 doctors looking at me because I got a staph infection without being at the hospital. Almost all of them are at the hospital, right? And even getting overheated right, can all produce the same symptoms, they're caused by different things. So that's the first thing, that's very important. That there are a lot of different reasons, maybe a lot of different things that could be wrong with kids where they can't read. Okay, I'm gonna mend it. So I'm gonna find out the different things, the different things that could be wrong with kids. Now, now how many people think it's still no good? Go ahead, why not? Well, why does something have to be wrong with the kids? What's wrong with the teaching system? Aha! Uh -huh. Tell me your name. Becky. Becky, say it again. Louder. 
Why does something? Why um, does something have to be wrong with the kids? Why can't we look at the teaching structure and figure out what's wrong with that? Exactly. It stinks because it starts with a pre-drawn conclusion. These kids can't read because there's something wrong with them. I know that. Now let's see what's wrong. Rather than asking, why can't these kids read? It's awful. It's evil. I used to have a guy in the philosophy. We were both, he said to me, he had training in Catholic theology, and he said to me, why don't you say what you mean? It's evil. I'll tell you in a second why it's evil. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. If we're going to maintain, let's go back to the going to say that every time a kid doesn't learn that it's her fault or his fault, then we have to make the following assumptions. Number one, there's a perfect system or systems to teach all normal children. Okay? We have perfect knowledge of that system. There's a perfect system, we know it, and we always do it perfectly. We never make mistakes in how we do it, implementing it. Therefore, the conclusion is any child who does not learn must be abnormal. Because we're perfect, we know exactly how to teach all normal kids. We do it and we know, we, we know what it is, how to, what it is. We know uh, uh, there is a way. We know it perfectly and we always implement it perfectly. We never make a mistake. Therefore, but if any one of these, one, two, or three, is not true, then the conclusion is not valid. You're not supposed to put red on the screen, but I don't care. See, it bleeds, but I don't care. It's not valid. It's obviously not true. Suppose I come to you, come back to me, and I say, look, there are kids with Down syndrome who are taught how to read, right? There are kids who, are, who have notable neurological damage who are taught how to read. We pay billions of dollars into the school system, and you can't teach kids how to read? What the hell is the matter with you? This kid has a schooling disability. He doesn't have dyslexia, it's dyscholia. What is wrong with the schools? We pay all this money, all this expertise, all this, what is wrong with you? It's your fault. The teaching's no good, the curriculum's no good. The testing is no good. Something's wrong here with the schools. You ought to be able to teach every kid how to read. And if you can't, you screwed up. That has, makes just as much sense as this one. Have any evidence? No. Do you have any sense anything's wrong with a kid? No. You have your prejudice, I have mine. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why it's evil. It's called blaming the victim. I'm going to do what I'm going to do the way I'm going to do it. And if you don't learn, you're sick. It's your fault. I don't have to change anything I'm doing. I'm not going to take any blame. I'm not going to say to myself, gee, what do I have to do to teach this kid better? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. What about meaning? Does the kid understand what you're talking about? What about understanding? Is the kid cognitively capable, co developmentally ready? Okay? Come back to me. What about adjusting ourselves? By the way, I'm going to fix up this slide, so I'm going to try to post it on the internet. Be a few more things on it. Like, what about adjusting what we do to meet the needs of the child? Okay? I'm going to give you two, remember I told you each class, I'm going to give you two brilliant pieces of insight now. First of all, I am going to give you, you don't have to take any other courses about psychology because I'm going to give you all the answers. The absolute, didn't I tell you, do this perfect definition of intelligence, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, you ready? Intelligence is the ability to impress the people who are testing your intelligence. Okay? That's what it is. Some people do not so hot on IQ tests and do better on other tests of intelligence, like Piaget's tests. 
There's a famous cartoon of an anthropologist going to an island and the native, you know, he can't hunt and he can't trap and he can't this. One native is saying to the other one, we better give this guy a test. I think he's retarded, right? So, you know, it depends on what you value. And now I'm going to give you more important. I know the answer. What is the best way to teach reading? I know the answer to that. What's the best way to teach math? What's the best way to teach this or what's the best way to teach English? I know the answer to that. Want to hear? Should I give it away? Depends on the kid. You all knew that already, right? So if you knew that, how can we have these fights? It's got to be phonics! So if it's strict phonics, those two kids will be learning disabled. It's whole word language. If it's whole word language, those two kids will be learning disabled. Pick two others. Those two kids in the back, right? Picked on these people enough. Okay? Does everybody really have to go at the same pace? Does that really prove we're teaching well by giving the same standardized test to every kid at the same time? Let's go back to the, to the PowerPoint. Are we really perfect? That's the question. Is it fair for the child to be blamed every time she doesn't learn? Is there no responsibility to examine what we do? Is it moral to decide whatever we to do whatever we decide to do, and then say if the kid has not succeeded, he has a disease, okay? And you understand, come to me for a second, okay? Let me pick some kids. The three of you come here. Okay? The three of them are having trouble in school. Face the camera here, come over here. Okay? Okay, this is TJ1, right? Okay? I test TJ1. He, uh, his IQ is very high, his achievement, eh, oh, he's learning disabled. I test, I forgot your name for the ninth time. Deneen. Again? Deneen. I test Deneen. IQ is. 62. Oh, retarded. <laughs> then I test TJ2, right? I remembered your name. Okay. His IQ is about 84. His achievement's about 80. Just a little slow, a little stupid. What can I tell you, right? Okay. There's no way that I can come out and say, you see this kid? It's, we're not teaching him right. You see this kid, we're not teaching him right. You see this kid, we're not teaching him right. There's no way. No matter what comes out, no matter what comes out, it's the kid's fault. That could be another kid, one more kid. This happens once in a blue moon. She's gonna tell us her name for the 19th time. Alexis. Alexis. Okay, Alexis, turn around, we got here. Alexis comes out, and it turns out that her IQ is 120 and her achievement is 118 on the achievement test. And she's doing lousy in school. That happens once in a blue moon. <coughs> then we can say, usually we say, gee, I wonder what's wrong with her home life. I wonder what's wrong with her motivation. Rarely you say, this happened, but it's once in a blue moon. And usually when this happens, we hear? When this happens, Usually the answer is, well, there's some other kind of social problem, not, I wonder if something's wrong with a teacher, something's wrong with a curriculum. I wonder if she's bored to tears or whatever. Okay, give all a big hand. Thank you very much. Very good, John. By the way, don't send us a bill. You don't get paid for acting on here. All right? Okay. So you can see that I've set it up so that every time, let's go back to the PowerPoint, every time... We, we don't succeed, we, we pin it on the kid. The kid has a disease, retarded or disabled. The question is, don't we need to understand how kids learn and develop? Don't we need to examine our teaching practices? Don't we need to remember that each kid's an individual and it's our responsibility to educate each one of them? Particularly with the kids labeled LD, 
come back to me for a second. Something is seriously wrong here. My first instinct would be there's something seriously wrong with the way this kid is being educated. Who was LD? TJ, TJ what, right? If you just test him, he seems to be fine. He does okay. Okay. Let me say one thing about the retarded, by the way. You cannot be called retarded just from, the, from these tests because a bunch of people who have IQs in the high 60s, there's nothing wrong with them. They get along, they play. So now you have to have behavioral tests to see if they get along with kids, to see if they're, you know, because obviously there are many kids who just, the test just doesn't mean much to them. For instance, migrant workers' kids were always being retested as retarded. So jumping from school to school, people said, ah, something's wrong here with the testing. But let's go back here, okay? The purpose of school should be to educate children, not to test them, sort them, label them, and control them. If you assume that this is the purpose of schools, to educate kids, then a lot doesn't make sense. If you assume that this is the purpose, to test, sort, and control kids, everything makes sense. And in order to do this, I'm hoping you got into this because you want to educate kids. You have to understand how kids think, develop, and learn. Right? And that's going to be the focus of the rest of the course. Okay? That's what we're going to be doing here. Come back to me. Okay, now, next time, I may not be here. Oh, look at all the sad faces. Okay? <laughs> there are some of the doctoral students who have expertise in certain fields, some of them more than I do, and they're going to be doing this from time to time, and now it's for posterity. This tape will run a few semesters, so I believe you'll have one of the, uh, my graduate assistants here next time talking about Skinner. We're going to start with learning and learning theories and how people are. Just to show you that this is not so easy, okay, we're going to take two votes. How many people think that basically people, you know that baby that's born like this, let me give you an invitation to a born baby. Oh, look, he smiled. No, he's burping. What's the matter with you? Okay? How many people think that basically what we are, we learn? We absorb knowledge from the environment, language, abilities. How many people think that that's basically how we come away? We learn what we are. Just about everybody. How many people think that some people are born with innate talents and some people are not that makes them more talented than others? Raise your hand if you think that. Well, those of you who... Uh, Head your hand up twice, you have to make up your mind. Either we learn everything or some things are innate. Or maybe it's a combination. So it's not as easy as it looks. I have a principle never to finish early, so just hang on. Okay? So it's not as easy as it looks. And what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at theories that say we learn what we are. Theories that are going to talk about things being innate. And a lot of you believe that. Is there anyone here who doesn't think that anger as an emotion is innate? So, it's not so simple. We're going to talk about theories that talk about how the two, maybe it's a combination of the two, a certain interaction that gives a quality. We're always going to be looking at what these people would say about how kids learn, how they think, what you should do, and ultimately what we should do about kids who don't learn. You can tell that's a little passion of mine and what the very nature of school should be. There are some people who are going to tell you, you need to have a clear idea of what you're going to teach the kids. There are some people who are going to tell you, that's not right. You need to let the kids follow their own star. There are some people going to tell you, give the kids skills and then show them how they apply. Let me come and tell you, say, uh-uh, I understand the skills are important, but first, have a project of interest to the kids and use that to develop the skills. There are some people who are going to tell you all the kids should learn the same things. Then we'll test them. Other people are going to tell you that's not true. Different kids can learn different things depending on their interests, their abilities, etc., etc. Now it's going to be hard for you because you're going to go into schools. Anyone who wants to go into a private school? No kidding. We have a few private school people. Anybody gone into Montessori schools? 
No kidding. They're public Montessori schools, some. So you can see that these schools have different philosophies about what the very nature of education ought to be, about how kids learn, what you ought to be trying to accomplish, what you ought to be trying to do. And we're going to look into that. You ought to look at it yourself. It's going to be hard when you get out to schools, because obviously there are people giving you advice and telling you what to do. But you should have it in the back of your mind all the time. And eventually, if you stick with this business, and not all people do who train to be teachers do, you can make a lot of difference yourself in the classroom. You can play the game and make a difference. I have faith in that. That's my faith. Okay? The teachers make a difference. Okay. Next time, we'll start on learning theory. <laughs>